Greetings, I'm the Mothman Historian, founder of the Appalachian Mystery Society, and tonight I am joined by Ryan and Carly. Hello. Hi. Ryan is a correspondent of the Appalachian Mystery Society, and he had mentioned to me that his wife had a bizarre experience in Ohio. So this is an audio interview to get down all the details. I think stories like this should be written down, documented, or recorded in some way. So Carly, if you could, could you please tell us your story? All right. So um, I would say this was probably about uh, 2009, and it was like late September. Um, I'm a Halloweeny, so I was out hanging Halloween decorations, and um, I felt like somebody was watching me from behind. Um, I got like really uneasy, so I went to the back of the house because I had woods that backed up to the back of my house, and I'd see like random dogs and stuff go through there sometimes. Well. I went to my back window in my bedroom and looked out the window and there was about a four foot tall hunched over like black wet leathery thing in my backyard. Uh, So that creeped me out and I immediately ran to the front of the house, um, turned on all the lights on my front porch and uh, then went back to the back. And when I went back there, there was nothing there. A couple weeks later, my ex-husband was putting trash in the trash cans that were back near uh, the same exact spot where I had seen it and he saw it running back up into the woods. Uh, This is by the Little Miami River. So it was was like weird when I started looking online, like what the heck was that? Uh, And then I read that it was uh, the Loveland Lizard. So that was, uh, that was my whole experience with that. I lived like right across um from the airport and then the river is right behind that um so i mean it was definitely like right above the floodplain and uh so this river apparently stretches up all the way to loveland ohio yeah where is it that you read about that story um i can't even remember it was some uh i think it was paranormal ohio or ohio paranormal i found it on um google and then i got like really interested in it and I can't remember what it was. Was it Ohio Paranormal? I couldn't tell you. Because I moved here from Texas, so I'd never heard of any of that. Um, did you say the coloration of it was blackened, or did it have a coloration? Was it? Well, it was, like, dark, so I just saw, like, the moonlight. It looked wet, and it was black. Okay, so so it was more of a silhouette than... I mean, I could see it's, I could see everything on it. It was, like, shimmering black, like it was like a like a seal or like a yeah like a a seal skin type thing when you actually talk to people around here that's how they describe it is not more like a frog but more almost just kind of like an aquatic lizard like a salamander like a smooth skinned aquatic lizard and um what was the height on the creature you said uh like four feet tall because it was hunched over any any clue on the date in that you said it was september 2009 do you know what time of september um, I, w- it was late September. So like right before October, um, cause I put up Halloween decorations pretty early. The, you said the moon was out cause of the moonlight. So was it a, was it a yeah. full moon that night? Um, it, it could have been, it was like, I would say like September 28th if I had to put a date on it cause it was right at the end of September. Did this experience make you more interested in mysterious things or just frightened of them? Uh, it made me definitely more interested. Because I was always, like, into, like, ghosts and stuff. But once I started looking into that, then I got into cryptids and really, like, love Bigfoot a lot. (laughs) Um, But also, like, we are ancient alien fanatics and literally watch it all the time. More so for the culture aspect, not the... The mumbo jumbo, but (laughs) it's just fun, you know, like, I love cryptids. Were there any other after effects from your experience? Um, I wouldn't say anything negative. I just opened my mind to like other beings, you know, that could possibly be here. And where where did you say you saw this in in the yard or or where? It was back up behind my house. So my house was like, um, it was really angled up on a hill. And then it was like back in the behind of the house, like where the woods met the yard. So did this make you more frightened of going outside and things like that? Yeah, I didn't really um, live there for that much longer after that. Uh, It was probably about six months after that. And was this the only time that you saw the creature? Yes. I went to Loveland to try to find it after that a couple, you know, years down the road, 
just to go look, but never saw anything. Okay. But there wasn't any other experiences, uh, you know, like that at the property? No, not with that. Have you ever had any other experiences in your life that you would consider paranormal? Definitely. Uh, I had a lot of experiences uh, growing up with like voices in the um, like upper corners of my bedroom that would sound like people just yelling and then a lot of like electrical issues. I don't know if it was related to that, but um, that was probably when I was like, I would say like four through seven. I heard that. And then um, my, when my grandma died, we used to smell a lot of um, her her perfume that she wore. It would just like pop up in the rooms that we were in uh, when we'd visit her house. Um, it was just like she was always around, I, I guess. I don't know how to explain it. So did multiple people in the house smell that or was it just you? And my mom and my dad. Um, my sister was at college when that happened, so it didn't really affect her that much but it happened to my mom a lot she's always had stuff happen with her like going back to her childhood in the study of extrasensory perception there's something called clear alience which is um like clear smelling because like clairvoyance is clear seeing clear audience is mm -hmm. clear clear hearing and clear alience is clear smelling and so that's actually something that people report as a sort of an extra sensory perception is being like smelling certain things at certain times. Yeah, I, I couldn't mistake that smell. I, I know that smell like so well. <laughs> any any other experiences you had uh, in childhood like that you would consider paranormal? Um, more so like going into the adolescence of my life, like teen years was when we got a lot of that um, that stuff happening with my grandma most of it happened like within my childhood so then the only other experiences I've had besides that um have been the shadow people that I've seen okay could you go into that a little bit um so um it was pretty much at that house that all that stuff happened at whenever I would go to sleep I would obviously get sleep paralysis but like definitely be awake and see the the black shadow um behind me, um, like six feet tall. Most of the times it would stand in my doorway. Um, but then on like real bad nights, it would be behind me. Um, it happened when I moved into my next house and then I went to an American Indian store and I told them what was happening and they gave me some, um, some quartz crystals and told me to put them in the corners of my room. And I honestly, I haven't had it since. Well, except for at the town home. And that was literally right when I moved out of my house. Yeah, she didn't have her crystals there. Because I saw that one, and that was when I was wide awake. Saw it twice. And she saw it with me the second time. We were actually watching it in the TV at the same time together. It was um, the first house we lived in together. I was just It was a three-level townhome, and our room was on the top floor, and the kitchen was in the, on the middle floor. So I went down to just get a drink or whatever from the kitchen, and as I was walking back up, the way there's like there was nothing behind the house there was no like ambient light street light anything like that so there was nothing really cutting through the back where that staircase was and i turned around and there was just this shadow behind me that was moving independent again there was no light source coming through the hallway either to where it would have made the shadow behind me and the way it was and the way it was down the steps was like it was coming up the steps also independent of me so i bucket to the room and i told her and she had never told me about you know, her seeing the shadow people or anything like that before. And it just kind of spooked me for a minute, but that was kind of the extent of the experience. I mean, that's as, as far as it went um, that time. And then the one time we're sitting on the bed and the TV's off and we had our little like lamps on, on the, our nightstands. And we're just seeing this thing move independent in the TV. There was no shadow on the wall or anything under the TV where the TV was mounted. It was just in the TV screen, just in the reflection. And then just kind of went away after, I don't know, 15 or 20 seconds or something like that. So never felt malicious or anything, but it was definitely bizarre. Okay, so I'm trying to get an understanding on these um, different living arrangements. So, uh, Carly, you're saying in your in your childhood home, there was weird activity. And then you moved um, with your ex-husband. And there was the, the creature and a shadow figure in that home. Is that is that right? Yes. And and then you moved with Ryan here. <laughs> Yep. <laughs> and uh, there's the, the shadow figure, which you're saying you think went away because of uh, Clear Quartz Crystal. Um, yeah. 
Did anything else happen no. after that? No. Um, honestly, after that, nothing. No. Okay. And yeah. um, I mean, just kind of quick little stuff that was just weird. But this was all within a week, the, those two occurrences. And I couldn't even begin to tell you when that was. It would have been around April or May is when she moved in in 2016. And uh, the only other time was we moved back in with my dad for like a hot minute. And my dad's house is a whole different story, which I didn't really experience too much. A lot of my friends have. Um, but the first night we were there, we put a little note on the door that just said no kids because, you know, we have my daughter and my stepson. Mm -hmm. And the first night at two o'clock in the morning, something pounds on the door and the no kids thing slides under the door. Well, the way his house is set up, I was to the door in maybe five to 10 seconds because we're night owls. We stay up mm -hmm. and I opened the door and the way his house is just a long shotgun house mm -hmm. to where you would have been able to see or hear at minimum somebody stirring away or messing with you but every light was off every door was shut and nothing so we thought that was kind of weird but it could have just been whatever but there's been a lot of um a lot of weird occurrences at my dad's house too but but in your your current home you haven't had anything like that no okay i want to ask um carly if there is a lot of weird things that happen in her family yeah for sure um my mom experienced most of it, I well, with her sisters, um, but they grew up moving a lot. So when they finally moved to like their final house, because they were in the military, they lived in Hot Springs, Arkansas. And I guess their parents had gone out one night. They're all down in the basement because it was like a, a full like apartment in their basement. So they're down there like watching TV and nobody's upstairs and they can hear footsteps walking along the whole like corridor because it's like a ranch style house so my mom said they went upstairs and they yelled like you need to leave because <laughs> they were spooked out but they went downstairs um after they had done that and it started stomping more so then they went and snuck out of the back of the house and waited for their parents to come home uh, because they wouldn't go back in the house uh my grandma was an antique dealer so she had tons of old like furniture and stuff and a lot of it had like this weird like it was just really negative parts of her house that had all these like really scary antiques in it from like the 1700s what about you ryan does does your family have a lot of weird happenings um mostly it was kind of contained in my dad's house my dad's a total skeptic he doesn't you know if you tell him something that happened he's like whatever but just um he grew up he's living right now in his childhood home where he moved out and then you know his sister owned it and she went to sell the house and he bought it whatever it's been in the house since the 50s and it used to be an old shoeing station for the pony express to where when we dug up his backyard there's two wells we found all the old horseshoes all kinds of weird just you know old tools and all this stuff well his dad died my grandpa died in the living room taking his shoes off just massive heart attack and then my grandma, two years to the day, died the exact same way, exact same room. And then not to get too graphic, in 2007, my mom committed suicide in the basement of the house. And then my dad, what was it 2018? Mm -hmm. My dad almost to the day had a heart attack in that room. He didn't die. Luckily, my um, sister-in-law was in there and she gave him CPR until they could, uh, until the uh, EMTs got there. But it was almost to the day in 2018, he had a heart attack in that room also. And then just my friends experiencing things. I had one guy who was actually one of the most rational. He's the head of Louisville's EMT department. Like the whole thing. Very rational, very critical guy. He wouldn't stay at my dad's house anymore because when he was sleeping on the couch, he would just see figures going back and forth in front of the um, the ambient lighting. You know, when you have a TV off, it has the red light or the blue light or whatever. Mm -hmm. Just ambient figures going back and forth in front of that. And he's sitting there staring at them. He refused to ever come back. Um, my sister used to get her hair pulled. My mom would say it felt like somebody was under their bed just pushing up on it. Just a very a lot of negative vibes in that house. From Carly's mother's side of the family and then your dad's house, that does seem like a lot of paranormal activity going on in both of your lives. Definitely. <laughs> yeah, no, but it was, what's weird is it's all so concentrated to a very specific time in my life and in her life. And then when we got together, something happened for a week and then nothing. And now we have this lamppost in our house that was one of her grandma's. And Carly was telling me there was some energy tied to that. But since we've had it, nothing. Uh, you said Carly said there was energy tied to it. Do you think that she has the ability to sense more that something is tied to an object? 
I would say so because she knows me. I'm pretty stoic about almost everything. She's a little bit more sensitive to to vibes, I guess you could say. Just the air in a room to where she can sense something. And I'm like, ah, whatever you're overreacting. Then all of a sudden, whatever she's sensing is what's happening a couple minutes later. Even when it just comes to people and their overall attitudes. and Yeah, I can put, I can tell people's like intentions immediately. So would you... Uh, consider yourself a, a psychic or a spiritually sensitive person in that way then? Um, not psychic. I just say I am very receptive um, to a lot of energy. Okay. Does, does that run the family, you think? Um, I would say on my mom's side, definitely. Mm -hmm. But I think I'm, I've uh, embraced it more than them. Um, I'm not scared of, you know, <laughs> exploring <laughs> what's out there to find uh, other, you know, options of uh enlightenment mm -hmm. so <laughs> well put it this way she has one of her her favorite quotes from her mom tattooed on her arm and it's i've seen a lot of death yeah <laughs> jeez <laughs> yeah okay do, yeah. do you ever feel other people's emotions as your own uh yeah <laughs> all the time <laughs> like a heightened sense of empathy yeah uh, i believe so yeah mm -hmm. for sure yeah. could you could you go into that more <laughs> i mean i can look at you and tell what's wrong and know that something's wrong it's it's always it's never like whenever anybody is happy <laughs> or what they're feeling happy for it's immediately i can tell i just walk into a room and see your face and say like okay what's up what's wrong and she can always pinpoint exactly what's making them feel that way too it's, it wears me out i just go with it <laughs> <laughs> yeah it, it does sound like um some empathicness there um do you ever hear things or see things any visions um, I mean, I have some wild dreams, but I think, you know, I, I don't, I'm not sure if, cause I look up what my dreams mean, you know, uh, but I'm not sure if they correlate to any life, you know, happenings. Okay. Uh, have you ever had any dreams that came true? Like prophetic dreams? Not that I can recall. You, you talked about, um, electronic interference in your house. Do you ever have that electronics messing up in your presence? Uh, definitely lights flicker. A lot. <laughs> so like watches um, stopping or street lights going out? Um, none of that. Okay. But the the attachment, I think, with the items uh, is because of my grandmother, because she collected antiques. Um, and she saw, I don't know, she just was drawn to pieces. So a lot of, like, I got a lot of her pieces in this house. Um, and I just feel, I don't know, I feel like the history of them. I always think about, like, who touched the desk? What year did they touch the desk? Uh -huh. Why did they paint the desk that color? You know, like that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. I know uh, certain people who can like pick up an object and sort of sense the, the story behind the object. And they've actually yeah. like told the story and it ended up being part of what actually happened. So anything like that? I would love for that to be true about a uh, 1959 TV that I have. Uh, the shell of I can just every time I look at it I can just see the family that was watching that TV it I just see them around like the TV yeah it, it does sound sound to me like there could be something there if you like have someone in the family that collects antiques and things like that and then you have <laughs> uh, possible paranormal activity going on that it could be like because of the antiques being brought in and maybe because right. of the sensitiveness so right. I wonder about that well, her grandma, that was kind of her, um, that's what she did for a living, too. So she just poured everything into antiques, whether it was just something she was keeping at the house or, you know, something she was selling. Uh -huh. So with her putting so much energy into her collecting and selling and flipping the antiques, and this was before the internet and actually having to go and seek out all this stuff. and Because it wasn't like a consignment shop, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I don't know if that has anything to do with it, the amount of energy somebody puts into something, and that's what you're receiving. Do either of you go antiquing a lot and like pick up items and things like that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm obsessed. <laughs> yeah. Uh, a lot of religious art I'm attracted to for some reason. Anything? And I'm not very religious, so. <laughs> Anything specific? Um, The Virgin Mary. I, I really uh, am attracted to those pieces. I Everybody has that one picture of Jesus in their house, like growing up, where he's looking off to the side. Uh, I collect those but uh, sure. mostly virgin mary 
I can send you a picture of it later. You'll okay. you'll recognize it immediately. Is your is your family religious? Like? Yes. Okay. I'm not, but my mom and dad and their parents are. Um, but I'm not at all. Okay. Uh, if you wouldn't mind me asking, of uh, any specific denomination or? Uh, they're just Christian, non-denominational Christians. My dad was um Baptist, I think, growing up. Back onto the the sort of intuitiveness thing. Do you do you think you have a lot of luck? Like, are you good at gambling? Uh, ever walk down the street, find a hundred dollars laying there? Any good luck? <laughs> <laughs> I'd say I'm good at gambling, but I don't know when to stop. <laughs> I get ahead of myself. She's she's good at gambling. She's not good at leaving the casino. <laughs> Yeah, but would you consider yourself a, a lucky person in, in terms of uh, uh, randomness and odds and things like that? Yes, really lucky. <laughs> like um, sort of like rolling the dice and guessing what's going to land on kind of uh, random chance stuff, not just, you know, fortunate in life, but random chance stuff, right? Yes, and I have a, a thing with the number three. All of it, any threes, any re- repetition of threes, I'm just really into uh, the number three for some reason. It's... Oh. Sorry, kind of a little footnote um, to right when she moved in, almost every single morning, she woke up at 3.30 in the morning. No alarm. Almost every single morning. Yeah, it's been a, it's a very prevalent thing in my life. I don't know what it means. I don't know why, but. Just 3.30 in the morning, she's up, like on the dot, almost every single morning. Yeah, well, that's, that's a, a number that's very big in a lot of different forms of spirituality. You could go to... Um, you know, the Holy Trinity or Christ being 33 when he was crucified or the Freemasons, they like the number 33. There's a lot of different mm-hmm. spirituality that goes in threes. And, you know, a lot of things go in threes, even storytelling, beginning, middle, end, and joke telling, the rule of thirds and all that sort of thing. So, you know, it makes sense. Yeah, right. that's a number, a number that I like as well. Uh, it's 33 and three. It pops up a lot in research, but you kind of got to, you know, not focus on it too much. Right. Because then I'll obsess over it. Yeah. Yeah, so any other odd, meaningful coincidences in your life then? Um, that's pretty much the extent of it. I uh, I just try to, you know, keep open and receptive to it all. Okay. You, you said you were into collecting religious art. There are other specific mm-hmm. paintings that you have. Could you like... Like a lot of uh, Catholic art, because I, I grew up um, like lower Texas. So, you know, there's a lot of like Mexican influence, so... Mm-hmm. I really love the uh, like holographic Jesus stuff where you like shift and you can it changes to the Virgin Mary and the baby. Mm-hmm. Um, I collect a lot of uh, a lot of Virgin Mary stuff. Okay, yeah. like uh, our Guadalupe, <laughs> perhaps. Um, I think. Well, no, it's more actually, yeah, because I you paint them. Yeah. <laughs> I paint them to look like that. You you paint them to look like that. Yeah, so like you know how the the virgin has all the colors behind her, like figurines that I've painted the backgrounds the same colors on them to make them look the same. I have probably about twelve of them. <laughs> I just every time I see one, I get one, and then I paint it so it <laughs> so it looks like a Day of the Dead kind of thing. Okay. Um. So as as a kid, then did you uh, go to church or were you raised in that environment before uh, yeah. being more secular? Yes. Yes. Um, probably since I remember until I was probably about 16 or 17, I was into it and went to church and like got baptized and all that. And then I don't know, I just like woke up one day and I was like, it it was just all gone. (laughs) Have you ever had any uh, religious experiences or miracles or anything like that? Uh, I wouldn't say so. I study um, a lot of like Marian apparitions and things like that. Yeah. Um, so it's kind of funny that, that popped up in the discussion. I want to go back to, to Ryan for a bit here because uh, I find it fascinating that you, you both kind of have weird things going in your life. Could you go into um, something that you mentioned in chat one day, which was uh, the devil dogs in Kentucky? Could you go into that? Yeah, you know, my mom's side of the family, they're from Crittenden, Kentucky, which is, if you know anything about Kentucky, you're kind of, it's not... So far, you're only maybe 30 miles from Cincinnati, but I mean, you're kind of out there. And they have just hunted their entire lives. Almost all my mom's brothers, uncles, cousins, they're all hunters, survivalists. They isolate themselves on purpose, essentially. And uh, yeah, they would just talk about these things so nonchalant and just matter of fact that something's out there. We don't know what it is, but they kind of have their own strict code to where they don't have any type of livestock or crops or anything like that. It's weird. I mean, they'll 
you know, can stuff. They have little small gardens, but they're not going to shoot a coyote because they can't eat a coyote. And it's not going to be, it's not a pest to them. They learn to live with them and kind of get them off their property in other ways. So they never like shoot at these things, but they would tell you that they're out there. You know, it's just, it is what it is. You just kind of work around them, let them do your thing, their thing, you do your thing. And that's what kind of intrigued me about it was you have this, if it was, you know, captured or anything like that, this world shattering thing out there, but they just, they could care less. And, and, and that's what kind of really made me uh, pay attention to it. And you said they called them devil dogs. Yeah, that was their description for them. Again, I don't know if they, because uh, they said they would be either like kind of a silvery or grayish or white. So they called them that. I don't know if they were hip to any type of, you know, lingo or portmanteaus or any of this stuff, you know. Yeah. Just that's what they they called them. They wouldn't even say if they were even canine in behavior or anything like that. They say they would walk on all fours and on their hind legs. Hmm. Okay. So I find it interesting that both of you have had uh, bizarre experiences and interests in the bizarre throughout your life. Did that come up? when you guys met or is it something you discovered later discovered later we actually got you know we started talking years ago on myspace and it was strictly because of music and that's it hmm. what, what kind of music you know metal <laughs> Ex- extreme metal i guess you could say black metal death metal that kind of stuff okay but it was never anything like you know we didn't really talk about it until i saw the shadow thing and we were together for at that point six or seven months and I had known her for 10 years prior to that. So, Carly, how long was it that you had experiences with shadow figures? Um, so from 2009 on okay. until 2015, 16. Okay, so that happened after the creature you saw? Yeah. Okay. It started, it started like, in that same house. And then it was, I mean, it was before... I had the shadow people experiences before the creature, but it went on until... 2015 or 16 do, do you think because you you describe the creature as like you saw it in the dark and it was like shadowy would do you think there it's a similarity there that it's a that was also a, a shadow figure or do you think that was a more real creature uh definitely more real okay yeah, there was a 3d shape to it i mean a yeah it was definitely more real so like the shadow people they are more of like a i don't know like a horrible feeling you know what i mean Mm -hmm. like not only do they look the way that they look they have no features it's just the shadow and it feels horrible the thing that i saw just spooked me because i didn't know what it was you know what i mean okay you have any ideas on what you think it could have possibly been other than just uh the loveland creature um no i mean at that time i had no idea what i even thought it was so um I mean, the only thing I could relate it to would be a, I don't even know, a, a wet, a wet person that was a horrible shape. And the bird theory doesn't work on her either because she can point out every bird in the sky. No, so. I wasn't going to go there. Yeah, that's just kind of a little, that's you, our inside thing. Okay. Have you ever drawn so it? it? Yeah, I mean, I could draw it. It was hunched over and like, like um, Danny DeVito as the penguin kind of body <laughs> like hunched over <laughs> i would say definitely danny devito shape okay well it would it would be cool if you could uh sort of draw it or sketch it and send it my way yeah for sure because it all ran together like the back ran into the head you know what i mean like it was just like no neck i guess how do you explain that like, like, a, like a salamander that's standing <laughs> upright like, yeah it was weird like someone where their their shoulders are arched up and their heads down. Yes, okay. but it's connected. So like just a uh, kind of an inhuman shape, like almost an uncanny valley type thing, to where it wants you to think it's humanoid, but it's not. What kind of feeling did you have at that point? Um, I just got spooked and ran away. It was just like uh, it was something I could move away from. The shadow people, you, I can't move away from. Was it, there was no other um, like lingering thoughts about it in the in the aftermath. Uh, well, then that's when I started doing all the research, uh-huh. just like incessantly doing research on it, just trying to figure out what it was. And then that's when I I just typed in the location. I was just like Cincinnati, Ohio, wet lizard thing, <laughs> <laughs> and that came up. And I was like, oh my god, that's it. Because Cincinnati's not really known for its cryptids. It's more of a haunted hot spot. There's a lot of uh, Milford, Ohio, which is in Claremont County, 20 minutes outside of Cincinnati. 
is one of the higher concentrations of Bigfoot sightings in the United States. That's kind of where I got into it after hearing about the devil dogs and then, you know, being 10 to 12, your first thing you're going to see is Bigfoot. Mm -hmm. And even though there's not a lot of written accounts, you'll find people all over that have seen it, but are just kind of more whatever about it. It's a very bizarre cultural thing around here with the uh, Loveland Frogman because it's just, it's a thing. It's just, you know what I mean? Like it's not a threat or... Yeah, it's like a bit of a mascot. But yeah, kinda, before yeah. that experience, I lived it in my entire life. Like, and I'd lived here for at least ten years before that. I'd never heard of it. Mm-hmm. Have either of you ever seen any other creature that you couldn't identify, other than what you went into thus far? No, I haven't. I've heard things camping, and um, even you know Justin in the group longboard. He can tell you about Red River Gorge and just the lingering feelings you get when you're on those trails. It's where something's watching you. And I mean, you go down to those areas and you grow up in Kentucky, you're familiar with black bears. We consider them just big dogs. You know what I mean? Just whatever. But there's something down there. And the one time Carly and I were down there camping, I mean, it sounded like someone was putting force into knocking these trees over. And usually you have kind of a typical time of the year when the trees are falling. And that's at the gorge around January, February. This was in, what, August or September when we went down there? And we found bullet casings in our camp. But, you know, who's to say it wasn't just some animal, you know? Was, was... Yeah, I know. But you, you hear the stuff and you hear the stories and then you, you hear it. That's what I'm saying is I could hear the stuff all day long. That doesn't sound like a black bear to me. I know what they sound like when they're scratching trees. They can knock them over pretty easily, too. But these were big trees. One actually fell in the middle of the road where we were staying. And I actually sent it to Longboard because I went to go move it out of the way. And I'm like, how the hell did this tree even fall here? Because there was like a cliff face and there wasn't really anything, you know what I mean? And it wasn't uprooted or anything like that. It was, it was weird. But again, with stuff like that, I don't automatically jump to conclusions. It's just I have weird little spurts in my life where it's 10 to 20 seconds of something being weird that I can't explain. And then that's it. So it's like, where do I go from here? There's literally no other evidence or anything that I can go off of my personal experience except for me just going, huh. So you, you came into the group, Appalachian Mystery Society, through Longboard, or Justin. Uh, how did you yeah. meet him? I met him when I was 13 or 14, and again, through music, he played bass. He was like friends with the f- with one of my good friends, and we were getting a band together, and we needed a bassist. I was like, oh, my friend plays bass, because he went to a different high school, and then, yeah, that's how we hooked up, and yeah, just have been, you know, best friends ever since. So what was your thoughts when he reached out to you about the group, though? He knew kind of where I stood on a lot of stuff and what my interests were. And he told me that he was part of this group. And uh, because Carly and I were talking about going to Point Pleasant like uh, a couple months ago, but just something just always came up to where we couldn't get a birthday. Pandemic. Well, (laughs) you know, the pandemic, but then like just like birthday parties or something with our kids or this, that or the other just always constantly came up. Well, and then he went up to Point Pleasant, and we literally had it all scheduled out because the way our, our kids work with their other parents and stuff, we have to schedule everything out. You know what I mean? Just it has to be a couple weeks in advance. And then I was like, oh, well, we're going up in a week. And then he kind of got on this um, talking about the group. And I was like, well, that sounds rad. And that's when he talked to you, I guess, the invitation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Um, so you guys wanted to go to Point Pleasant. So I assume then that Carly and you have both been really interested in monsters, I guess, since she had her experience and you had the, the stories from your family. Yeah. Yes. From a very young age. Okay, that's very interesting how all that sort of comes together. Yeah. And I guess her, her, her cryptid thing was a little bit later. I was always kind of, I was more of a, uh, just kind of a flesh and blood cryptid guy for like the longest time. Same with the, uh, being a nuts and bolts EP guy for the longest time. And then. Just when you dig further, further into it, it's just a lot of stuff, you know, the Valet, Keel, the Forte and stuff makes sense. Mm-hmm. Some of the ET stuff makes sense. Okay. Uh, like I, I said in the group, I have kind of a hybridization of where I stand on stuff. Yeah, we, we've been talking about uh, UFOs and the different uh, theories and things for, for that. And you were talking about how the different perspectives that you have going around in your mind, trying to, you know, figure out of all <laughs> the theories what you agree with. It just makes sense of even 10% of it, you know? Yeah. If you don't mind me asking, what what's your spiritual background or if you have one? I have uh, zero spiritual background. My family was not spiritual or religious anyway. Um, it always fascinated me. I went to church with my friends, not to um, necessarily because I believed or anything like that, but just 
to see what it was about, essentially. And I'm absolutely infatuated with the history of religion, Mm -hmm. how it all came about. I was actually a theology major and a geology minor and then also political science there, too. But nothing because I actually, like, I I resonated, the the spiritual aspect of it resonated with me, but more as a cultural and historical aspect of it. Yeah, Uh, I'm definitely interested in, in like, a a psychological way, definitely. Like, interested in um, how those different beliefs come about and influence culture, definitely. Yeah, it was just all from nomadic tribes, just cherry-picking stuff from everywhere they went. (laughs) Yeah, definitely. But, you know, just the... (laughs) The um, sort of evolution of it over time, the different um, branching paths and all that. I, yeah. I see a lot of the same with folklore and things like that. The same kind of, you know, way in which these things move and come into being. Well, that's all, re- that's all religion started out as was sort of a folklore. It was a oral tradition. And you had the whole pantheon. The only reason why you had that back in the day where you had the uh, multi-theistic and the polytheistic um, civilizations where they're trying to explain away natural things that they couldn't explain. But then once you started figuring out that, oh, water's coming from springs and they started whittling down the gods because you no longer need a Prometheus and Mercury and all this other stuff. We started figuring out what was actually going on, the setting of the sun and the rising of the moon. Um, Because, like, I have the Hecate tattooed on my arm, which they thought was responsible for the seasons so once they started willing all that out then you just use religion to explain the unexplainable because what's the two biggest things we can't explain right now how did we get here how did the universe get here and that's the whole basis of christianity they just boiled it down to those two points that's well, the base of a lot of different religions of course oh yeah absolutely old testament for sure almost exactly zoroastrianism yes. almost word for word yes so you definitely are interested in theology there pull out a uh, zoroastrianism yeah <laughs> Her a Mazda, because Zoroastrianism was the very first documented religion. I wouldn't say the very first, because yeah, who one knows, there's whatever 4,000 active religions right now. That's the one with uh, the dualism, where it's like the good and the evil, different, they like divide. It was the them. very first one, yes, yeah, and the there was a spirit. divine reward and a uh, actual punishment, where mm-hmm. at that point, the Greeks, the Egyptians, all that stuff, if you die, you just went to Hades, same as everybody else. Mm-hmm. I mean, you had Tartarus and Elysium, but you, nobody else is going there. Yeah. Okay, now, now we're off way into theology. But I was just going to point yeah, out. Yeah, yeah, it happens. Yeah, I was just going to point out that <laughs> back, back in the day, each different uh, region had like their local god, right? They had like, which is kind of like a mascot in a way, which is their, the god of their place. Essentially, like, yeah. the, the Greek city state of Athens had like Athena and things like that. So every yeah. sort of region had their local god. And if you look around now, we, we have, um, you know, in Point Pleasant in Mason County, we have the Mothman in uh, Loveland, Ohio. They got the, the Frogman. You can look at it in the way sort of they have their their folkloric being that represents them in that same kind of way. I think I, I was saying you you were saying that um, it's a way to explain something like they use it sort of like a, as a placeholder for something that one day they later understood. Um, perhaps what we're doing now is sort of a a placeholder for something that we will one day understand as well. I absolutely believe that's all this is. Mm-hmm. We could say something, but then they'll figure out in a hundred years from now. Yeah, we had the right. We were on the right path. Our terminology might have been completely wrong, but you know, we might have been using the term ultra terrestrial, extraterrestrial, right? If you just change the name in a different context. Yeah. But it's important to have that placeholder; otherwise, it gets lost. It gets lost to time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So one one day there might be a, an explanation, like, okay, here's what the the Mothman and the Frogman and all the different creatures they were seeing. Here's what that was. You know, so maybe a, a natural explanation yeah. or something. Yeah, but for now, you know, just. You just keep pounding away and hoping you can figure it out. Yep, definitely. I mean, that's the the most you can do. Mm -hmm. Uh, So back to Carly for a minute. Um, I asked if any other creature sightings, uh, did you answer that? Was there any other creature sightings you've seen? I have not seen anything other than that in my life, unfortunately. (laughs) (laughs) I'm looking, I promise. (laughs) More than I've seen. So you mentioned um, different uh, items you have that you feel have some sort of feeling to them. Do, do you think that you currently own a, a haunted item? Um, I, I wouldn't say haunted. I don't get any, um, nothing happens with them now, but I feel energy with them. Like, I, I just feel like the family energy of them, I guess. Yeah. So That's what like I a, pick up most from them. So like a charged item, not necessarily anything. Sent- yeah, exactly. That's exactly what it is. So I feel... That's crazy. <laughs> I didn't even think about that. The TV that I have the most, I, I feel that feeling with uh, because I got it out of um, 
like a 90 year old woman's attic, so, but it was empty and stripped. So it had not, it, they hadn't used it in, in ages, you know? So, so have either of you owned an item that you would say is haunted? No, she said the, what was it? Something around my mom's picture. Uh, every day. I mean, there's an, it's just happenings, but I don't think it's related. Yeah, but that's where I just kind of, I almost, you know what I mean? Like I said, when stuff happens to me, it's just that, well, huh. And then where do I go from there? I can look it up all day long, but that doesn't change what happened to me in the brief amount of time I had with the experience. Uh, okay. It's a very, very tricky road to go down to navigate your own thoughts on the thing when it's you couldn't even process your own thoughts in the first place. So have either of you like tried to get a haunted item, like ever gone after an item that you thought was haunted and tried to buy it for that reason or anything like that? No, the market around here for that, they would not even bring that up. I'm yeah, I'm not interested in any like negative haunted stuff. I'm just more uh positive really. Everything that I collect has like positive feelings to me. Would you would either of you be like investigators of paranormal activity of like hauntings and things like that, like going to a haunted location and trying to see what happens? Yes, for sure. I would love to do well, that. Well, I actually used to do that. There was one place that me and a couple of my friends who were actually serious about it because people would go and, you know, kind of party and everything else, just like everywhere else. But it was a place in Maysville that was like a supposedly a hot spot for years called Hayeswood Hospital, right on the Ohio River also. Almost as if all these things, especially in Ohio, Ohio and Kentucky, your main haunted places like Bobby Mackey's Music World. If you've ever heard of that, that's it's right on the the confluence of the Ohio and the Licking River. And same thing with Hayeswood Hospital. Well, we would go there and it wasn't that you would see anything, but stuff would be different. And like a gurney that was on the third floor would now be on the first. The elevator would change rooms, not while you're there, not while you're in the building, but we would document it that it's on the first floor of this wing. Well, then the next date it's on the third floor. Just weird, weird stuff like that that couldn't possibly happen because I'm a contractor. I know what goes into you're not moving an elevator manually at all. So there's no one in there you know, trying to get one over on anybody or anything like that. Have, have either of you tried any kind of spiritual communication or divination in any way? I don't think I ever have, like, actually taking it seriously. Carly? To be honest. No. no. Okay. Not not played around with a Ouija board or anything like that? Oh, well, you know, <laughs> I... Uh... <laughs> That's what I'm saying. I never took it seriously. We have Yeah, we, we have, have we... them. I have a <laughs> an Elvira Ouija board. Uh, <laughs> but... Uh, it's more of a kitschy thing for me. So, so no um, pendulum dowsing or spirit box no. communication. No. Nope. Oh, no. Okay, uh, Carly, could could you go more into the sleep paralysis experiences you had, or is it just a a shadow figure in the room, or can you go more into detail on what those experiences are like? Uh, so, uh they're absolutely terrifying. So it mm. starts off like I I feel like I I either am like super exhausted. I feel like I fall asleep super quickly, but my eyes don't fall asleep. Like everything about my body goes to sleep. My brain is like dead, but my eyes are open um, and I cannot move. I It's like absolutely terrifying because I'm screaming, but no noise is coming out of my um, my mouth. Mm -hmm. And then I can just see the shadow behind me or in front of me or in the doorway. I just remember that. But it was absolute, I could not move at all. But it's very aware of the lighting in my room, like where everything was. I, it was like my eyes were open in the daytime. So, so you see the same room that you go to sleep in, but it's just like this weirdness overlaid on, on top of that, essentially. Yes. Yes. Like an ominous feeling. Yeah. H how often does that happen? Um, I, I mean, I haven't had it since 2016. Sometimes I feel like I might start to go in it, but I, I kick myself out of it. But it's it's really rare now. Okay. Is there do you think there's anything specific that causes that? Um, I think it's stress related, possibly. Mm -hmm. Um, cause the entire time I was experiencing that was, you know, like I said, my ex husband, you know, it was a real traumatic time. I had a, a kid, I was I was younger. Um, didn't really know how to process my emotions. And I feel like that may have been a culprit of the sleep paralysis because I was just so stressed out. Mm -hmm. um, I have a friend who has that from time to time, and he says that it happens more when he lays on his back. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And or if I had fallen asleep, like with 
like, you know, if you have too many pillows on your bed Mm -hmm. and you're kind of like elevated, it would happen like that. If you can kick out of it, you know, that moment when you like fall asleep on a desk at school, Mm -hmm. it feels like that when you jolt yourself awake, if you can get out of it. Um, Do you ever have the feeling of something uh, sitting down on you or some kind of pressure like that? Um, It was always just like a force against my back. It always felt like it was pressure against the backside of my body. Yeah, because there's that uh, famous folkloric thing of the... Oh, yes. Succubus is an incubus. I know all about them. (laughs) I was was just going to say that when something like sits down on the chest is what I heard. Yep, I've heard that too. That's when I was researching a lot of that stuff, trying to figure out what it was. You've never had an experience where something sit down? Nope. It was always just behind me. So that's why my daughter's name was Lilith, the night hag. Okay. Is <laughs> that both of your daughter or just yours? Just mine. When I would come into the house with my ex, she would feel like she was in a trance. When we were in the house, we didn't know where it was coming from. Well, she was saying that she saw a nice man in her playroom and all this stuff. And we're just like, what the hell? And then the one time my uh, uh, ex came into the house, she went downstairs all the laundry was out of the washing or out of the dryer and it was piping hot. And we had like kind of a, it was an older house. So the basement had kind of like weird little like cubbies off the main room, like not necessarily full rooms, but just weird little cubbies, which is the concrete wall dividing it. And that was where all my tools and stuff were up in these cabinets. Well, all the cabinets were off the wall, tools everywhere. So then I guess one day when I was at work, she brought her friend in and they lit sage and did something. And it stopped immediately after that. My daughter was only two. So it's not like she had the um, the mental awareness to catch on to what they were doing to stop doing it or was feeding into what we were saying and all that stuff. So it was, it was a bizarre last of maybe two weeks hmm. just with her. Like, I never experienced any of it. Um, it was just from my ex-wife telling me and, you know, what my daughter would say. But okay. it's enough when your kid's saying that stuff, it kind of freaks you out. Yeah, yeah. D- definitely more... Uh, creepy when someone who you know shouldn't know anything like that says that kind of thing um yeah now i mean and she's one of those that has my my 10 year old has taken initiative with this stuff i posted a picture that she wrote on a whiteboard at my office when i had her one day when she went through every cryptid she could find oh yeah i saw that so it's definitely influenced her in some way too okay for better or worse that's really bizarre yeah. Did, did you name her that because you're interested in like theology and those kind of studies that you were doing? Absolutely. Okay. That's very interesting. I named her that strictly just to, you're not going to be subservient to any man. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's, that's a good, that's my hope and thoughts on that one at least. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, the term but... lullaby actually means uh, Lilith <laughs> abide, which means like to cast out Lilith before they go to sleep because it's like, um you know, the nightmares and stuff. It's the same reason why mobiles, like the little or mobiles came into um fashion was because they would hang amulets over the cribs and over where the uh the children slept to ward off Lilith. It's all kinds of crazy stuff behind Lilith. Mm-hmm. I looked into that uh in, like in 2017 after having a bunch of um reoccurring dreams and stuff. I looked into that sort of mythology. Very very interesting character, part of the Garden of Eden story, and then you know sort of becomes uh you know like I said demonized. And the Talmud was the, they strictly said the only reason she was kicked out was because she refused to lie under Adam. Yeah. So that's why she was rooted from the garden. And then when the snake actually wasn't Lucifer, the snake was yeah. Lilith. And that, that's also why Eve would be born of the rib as opposed to being born uh, of the dirt in the same way Adam was. In Judaism, it was, yeah, she was cast out, but was she really, did she really deserve it? I guess you could say. And that yeah. her life path was to be expected. Okay. But she's she's referenced in Solomon's Key and all that stuff with the Lilium and all that good fun stuff with the demonology, which demonology, the way it ties into UFOlogy. Yeah, definitely. I didn't expect two of the different divine feminine figures that I've been interested in. I didn't expect them both to come up in this conversation about uh, <laughs> frogmen. You know, it's like first you're talking about Mother Mary and then you're talking about uh, the Dark Mother, which is the other side of the maternal, you know, the divine feminine. <laughs> That's that's the way our mine and Carly's conversations usually go. <laughs> yep. Have either of you ever had out of body experiences? I have not. The closest I got though was kind of drug induced by a doctor, surgery wise. <laughs> Broke my shoulder in August and then had had to have two surgeries on it. And both times they put fentanyl into my IV 
and I felt like I was out of my body. Like I was not necessarily like looking down or anything, but I felt like if I turned my head, then it would take an extra five seconds for my head to turn. You know what I mean? Like I was turning independent of my body and moving independent of my body. Like I was sitting just above it, about an inch above it. And I was telling Carly, I feel great. (laughs) But it was bizarre. Like I could see, not that I was seeing double, but I felt like I was seeing and feeling something that wasn't while I was laying there. But again, that was fentanyl. So who knows? (laughs) Just an artificial version of what some people could be experiencing naturally. Yeah. You You do have all those receptors pretty much naturally built into you, whether they're firing or not. Mm -hmm. Did you see anything, like any visions other than just seeing double? No. And like I said, it didn't even feel like I was seeing double. I was like moving double and it Mm -hmm. wasn't delayed. Like I was moving independent and then there was something, my body, almost like a marionette, was trying to catch up. Uh, Carly, have you ever had an out-of-body experience? Uh, Unfortunately not. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Have either of you ever saw orbs or unexplainable lights no and I've, I've, i'm counting down the days but no i haven't seen anything okay carly uh lights orbs no nope. like a doctor going down like symptoms like i love it know, <laughs> <laughs> because we're answering the same way <laughs> like any any mild irritation <laughs> you know like <laughs> sightings of a, of a frogman may include you know symptoms yeah. of shadow figures <laughs> and yeah um, the different locations where these experiences have happened, have they been near something specific or something important in the, the landscape or the geography, topography of the place? Always near rivers, yeah. within like a mile of rivers. And as I said, my dad's house was an old shoeing station. One of the first original houses on his street, it was just his house and then a house up the street, which was a jail during the Pony Express days. He says Bobby Mackey's runs directly into the Lake and River. They have a well down there that went directly into the Lake and River. And they call it the portal to hell because of the amount of activity that is in that place that is just experienced by everyone. Yeah, uh, Point Pleasant is in the, the confluence of the Ohio and Kanawha River down yeah. there, right yeah. on Point Pleasant. It's super pretty. <laughs> yeah, we were down there probably about a month ago. Okay. Um, any of the locations near quarries or ravines? Mm-mm. Mm-mm. Nope. Uh, Tunnels or old mines? Mm-mm. No. Power plants, burial grounds, mounds. In this area, there's a cemetery every three blocks and power lines everywhere. Again, it's it's hard to, for a lot of activity for that kind of stuff, especially urban, um, it's kind of hard to attribute to, I think, personally, to any of that kind of stuff. Gravel pits and crossroads. Depends on your definition of a crossroad. Yeah. Well, the, the crossing of the rivers is one thing, but any other... Uh, yeah. Sort of crossroads or liminal, like in between type spaces. I mean, not necessarily besides your standard like city grid system. Yeah, I suppose everything to a certain extent is in between. You know, everything is in a, a process of changing in some way or another. Okay, those are just the different location trends that I thought I'd go down. But it's not like out in Independence, Kentucky. There's the Cody Road crossroad. I can't remember the name of the road. But the train trestle right there has a lot of activity that people have been experiencing since. Hell, that was like one of the things when my mom was growing up, and it's very real to people. I've never experienced anything. I've been out there plenty of times, but it is very real to the people that have experienced it. The people that I trust and believe more than anyone, people, you know, anybody else in the world. So that's another one. But that is at a, I guess you could say, a crossroads because it was the only roads out there at the time. I think uh, the experiences you guys have told haven't don't really have much to do with uh, the environment there, other than like you said, the running water. Because running water is a common thing, but you know, everywhere yeah. has water. It's where people set up their their houses and stuff is near running water. So, yeah. And obviously, my dad's house mm-hmm. underground because he has two wells in his yard, and they weren't they weren't rainwater, they weren't cisterns, they were wells. Okay, so um. Have either of you ever seen a light in the sky that you couldn't identify? Mm-mm. Like a UFO? No, I haven't, no. Okay, Carly? Uh, no. Have you ever had a conversation with an entity or a non-human entity or something you would consider alien? No. No. Okay. Uh, ever seen an aircraft or ship you couldn't explain? No. No. Ever met any bizarre strangers or had run-ins with people who acted peculiarly? Every day. <laughs> but, but I mean, it is, and again, it's so it would 
like I told said in the group, I was a probation officer for six years. And when I hear some of the descriptions of even anything, I'm I'm wondering how limited their worldview may have been, especially when it comes to men in black stories. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but you if you never uh, run as someone who you think is so peculiar and uncanny that they must be alien or non-human or paranormal in some way, right? Right. Right. And I've been all over the country. Me and yeah. Justin used to be in touring bands together, so we've been everywhere, talked to thousands of people, and now. Yeah, well, if you read some of the, <laughs> those Men in Black encounters, it does sound like maybe just a, a bit of a, a weird person who's normal, you know, like um, the trying to drink Jello and all that sort of thing that Kiel wrote about. Yeah. But that makes me wonder about, have you guys uh, met anyone who you felt had like a really spiritual way about them uh, that you could like sense that or feel that kind of thing? Like this person is mystical in some way. I have not. Nope. Okay. So so you guys have both uh, seen shadowy figures, but you've never seen like uh, a specter or a ghost or anything? Nope. Nope. Okay. Um, I'm obsessed with the woman in white because that was one of the very first ever like precautionary tales I ever heard. I've seen stuff in front of lights for a hot second that definitely had a human shape backlit you know for a second or two but um do either of you have any connection to fairy lore or fairy mythology i'm super irish and they brought a lot of that folklore over and again it was all centered around my mother's maiden name was greenwell that's what the whole town was built around was a well and then to have that at the house that she in her life at is a, a weird kind of bookend what about you carly nope no fairies uh, you mentioned uh, ancestry. Is that something that you would be comfortable talking about, Carly, what your ancestry is, if you know what it is? Yeah, I'm uh, Scottish and German. And you, Ryan, you, you, is your ancestry just Irish or is there anything else in there? Pretty much 100% Irish. Here's another one I had. Was there is there a location that you guys think a lot of paranormal stuff happens in? Like not just a, a haunted place, but like, you know, any any kind of area where tons of stuff weird happens that you can mention? The one that I always bring up is Bobby Mackey's because when they, it's not necessarily hauntings. It's more like a trickster that when it messes with you, it just messes with you. It's never really malevolent and it's not benevolent. It's right down the middle. It's just there to mess with you. And when you look at the early, you know, religious experiences and how they tie into the UFO abduction, and then you talk a lot about a lot of the um, kind of further down the fringe cryptid experiences that are totally psychological, but feel very real. It all ties in. It's all like centered at this one place. But if like, um, like locally speaking, I guess if there there's been a, a Sasquatch sighting and a UFO sighting, like where is it in in your mind? Milford, Ohio. Okay, why, why would you say that? That's just that's just where they've been sighted. Because yeah. <laughs> Milford is you have like your main street, your couple of little suburbs, and then it's just nothing. It's just been unincorporated woods forever. These things tend to happen in low population areas, so I suppose that makes sense. Mysteries mm-hmm. unincorporated. <laughs> yeah. Okay, what about you, Carly? Would you agree with that sentiment? Um, I mean, I, I've not heard anything about Milford, but uh, I haven't really read that much into <laughs> Milford, though. Ryan's a little bit more on the um, excursion side of trying to find things out. You haven't really looked into where the locations would be then? No. <laughs> okay. I mean, she's interested in the... I think more so the actual cryptid than where it's coming yeah, from. Yeah, I'm into the being of it. Yeah, I've heard you speak on the spirits and the monsters, but what about the, the UFOs? Are you interested in UFOs at all? I'm super interested in UFOs, uh, and it started with Cocoon. That movie got me super hyped on UFOs for some reason. But, I mean, what is that? Devil's uh, Peak in thir- Close Encounters of the Third Kind? Mm-hmm. That was always uh, something I think that's probably like a supernatural area for real okay so on that subject then could both of you go down like some of your paranormal and Fordian influences and inspirations um mine would definitely be um you know like tales from the crypt a lot um well they pulled from folklore yeah i grew up watching that i was always um my mom was way into alien movies, so we watched a lot of stuff about aliens. And then, honestly, for about a year and a half, Ryan and I fell asleep to only alien stuff. Um, I, I've never experienced anything in, in like my life, though, that's alien-related. Ryan, any uh, influences there? Fordian, paranormal, folkloric, otherwise? Again, it mostly came from my mom's side of the family, because we just always 
we'd always yeah. camp with them yeah. somewhere on their property and they would just tell these stories and it wasn't to like freak people out it was just here's what we saw today so that kind of started me down the rabbit hole real young and again this was before i'm 35 so this was before you know internet search engines were really a thing but just the information but i would get my hands on any book that i could get my hands on and just being kind of ignorant to it you know going to the public library it was just all bigfoot stuff so you obviously had your willow creek and you know the patterson gimlin stuff and that was pretty much all there was at that time and then honestly what got me into the mothman was the movie and when i you know, just looked it up because I just, I get bored. And if I'm watching a movie while I'm watching the movie, I'll look it up. It's based off a true story. If it says that anywhere near it, I'm looking it up. That's what kind of started me on Keel and Valet and um, like Raymond Fowler and all them getting real into it. And I was kind of like, I was always real suspect of Gray Barker, mm -hmm. but I read a bunch of his stuff. That kind of set me down that rabbit hole when it came to the the UFOs, reading all the old generals reports and reading about UFOs in the war was kind of what got me real far down into the nuts and bolts aspect of it. But then, like I said, later on, once you start to get into Keel and Valet and that whole scene, it kind of opens you up a little bit more to where I, I don't think they're mutually exclusive, but I think there's kind of tears to it. To where there might be nuts and bolts, there might be an advanced civilization. Again, if somebody even had 10,000 years head start on us, who knows where they could be with their technology right now. That's the way I look at the nuts and bolts things, but there also might be something that's actually on a higher plane than them too that's coming into play also. We're just, I just think we're just one of many to them though. Or we might even be a vacation hotspot for them. I don't know. I don't know their motivations. Uh, as Keel said, the Disneyland of the gods. Yep, exactly. At some point we should do, uh, do some kind of video where we just talk about UFOs. Carly, have you read into Keel and Valet and any of the things we're talking about here? No, my attention span's really short, so. <laughs> yeah, Valet's not for you. It's, it's a little bit too, <laughs> I would say, advanced for me, my brain capacity. I, I'm a simple type of woman. <laughs> Next question I have here is, are either of you into any occultism or magic of any kind? All depends, again, on your definition. I'm into light um, witchcraft. Okay. Could could you go into that a bit? Mostly uh with the the crystals um but I also um uh, use my cauldron. cauldron quite often. I smudge my house a lot. I do some spells. Um but that's it's it's not like I'm not fully dedicated to it. I'm a just, you know. It's like trial it's like a trial size in yes. you know. Hmm. Okay. Uh Ryan, ever done any <laughs> occultism? No. Um now magic is again how you define it mostly just the chaos magic where you try to will it into the world but you know i've not really practiced it so I've, I've looked into you know the left hand path magic and all the crowley stuff back in the day but eh, it was too much for me the left hand path because all you left handers like my wife are evil uh, she left-handed <laughs> yeah. yeah she's a witch well that makes sense it's in the malleus maleficarum if you're left-handed <laughs> Baphomet with the upturned hand and the downturned hand with left hand, right hand path. Okay. We have that actually above our TV. Of course. <laughs> you guys are spray painted. <laughs> spray, we spray painted it gold and then we have the moon cycle below it. That you, you guys just seem to be into everything that, that, I, that I research into. Because like, okay. I'm all over the place as well with my research. Marian devotion and uh, Marian apparitions and then like completely other side, Baphomet and all that sort of thing. Yeah. And you guys have both. And then you read one thing you're like, you're like, this makes sense. And you read something else that completely contradicts. And you're like, well, this makes sense, too. Like, where do I go? <laughs> yeah. Um, either of you know your, your zodiac sign. I'm a November Scorpio. And I'm a Taurus born in May. Personally, not not really into all that, you know. But, you know, it's something that is worth looking into, at least. I mean, we have the tapestry on our wall, but. It's nothing. It just looks cool. <laughs> <laughs> just looks cool. Would either of you be willing to share what your blood type is? Honestly, I, I don't even know what I have, it is. I have not a clue, and I've donated blood probably 30 or 40 <laughs> times. I could not tell you. I know I'm a universal donor. Because that's like a, another thing to ask witnesses. People say there, there are certain blood types that have experiences more, and just kind of get that kind of data. Well, we should check into that. Mm -hmm. Have either of you experienced any uh, missing time? I have once. It was kind of a collective thing. Um, it was everybody in the car. We were at a green light, and it felt like a green flash. And all of a sudden, four minutes was gone. Hmm. And we noticed because we were all just like kind of jamming out to a song, and then four minutes was gone, and the song was over. We all had no clue what happened. 
it was like when the light went from red to green, it looked almost like it flashed. And then four minutes was gone. And it was on a busy street. No cars behind us. Nothing around us. Like, no beeping. I don't know if any cars went around us or whatever happened. We just all experienced just four minutes gone. That's it. Hmm. Yeah. Um, Carly, ever had any, any missing time? No. Because, like, cer- certain people say that you can, you know, something happens and you kind of uh, remove that part from your memory. So, you know, people go into that with UFOs and that sort of thing. People also talk about, like, time dilation, where, like, people who claim to have gone to other worlds or whatever, they or they leave for hours and hours and hours, and they come back, and it's only been a few minutes. You know, who knows? You could have gone to Venus and hung out with the Venusians in that, those four minutes. Yeah, hung out, with, hung out with Valiant Thor. Yes. I'm glad you know all the UFO stuff. <laughs> Valiant Thor, Strangers of the Pentagon, by Frank Strangest. Yeah. And yeah. Orthon. That's a, that's a book. Um, so, uh, Carly, how, how deep have you gone into UFOs? You said you were interested in it. What's your interest brought you to look into? Most of it comes from, like, my interest in, like, where we actually come from. You know, the whole starseed thing and kind of correlates to that. It, it's just kind of weird how, like, you know, all those things would happen in, you know, ancient times. And then they're all the same all around the world. So my fascination is more about, like, how did we get here? Are we from them or, you know... Like that type of stuff. Is there is there any specific books you would point to or, or documentaries or specific researchers you like? Um, not really. Unfortunately, Ryan's more of the uh, scholar here. <laughs> yeah, well, you mentioned ancient aliens. So I guess that would be uh, something that you're, you'd watch, right? Yes, a lot. <laughs> but <laughs> It's kind of like the popcorn version of it, though. But it, I mean, they bring up some good, interesting points. But then some of it, you're like, eh, whatever. But yeah, we watch a lot of that just because it's what's on. It's it's entertaining. But at the same time, it's mostly horse shit. <laughs> but I'm more fascinated by the uh, cultural impacts around the world. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. Uh, that's kind of why I like uh, Valet and stuff like that. He kind of points out how this could be reinterpreted in other different cultures, like as fairy lore or things like that. And, you know, I kind of yeah. look at the whole alien thing as another one of those masks that the phenomena wears, like another different framework that people could see this phenomena. But I don't really think that the alien is the, the true face. I don't really think that any of these different faces that we have for it is the true face. I think it's all a mask and you know is kind of what he hints at mostly is that you're putting your own perception on it to where yeah. the explosion of the 50 sci-fi movies and all that stuff to where it's almost like a tulpa you know to where you're you're willing it out there mm-hmm. you're making it uh, collective consciousness become real i see the different cultures viewing it in different ways and sort of putting a different mask on the same phenomena and i think the, the true phenomena would be uh, faceless like it doesn't actually you know, fit into any of those different frameworks, and it's just a this big unknown. Just a mark. Big un- but people yeah. have different ways of viewing it. Like one person's uh, fairy or demon or alien, you know, is another person's uh, angel or deity or what have you. So, well, when it comes to the angels and the deities that are explained even in the Bible or almost in any type of culture, when they came down, they're describing combustion. Yeah, I was saying they're the, they're the same thing, but they we view them in different ways, like. A light in the sky it could be a UFO. It could be in olden times they would say it was a, a witch with a broomstick that had a lantern on it. So they would just see the light and they would kind of extrapolate from the light what it must have been. So you have different frames of reference yep. for what the same thing is. It's just a light, but, you know, to different people, it's different things. Well, what I'm saying is like in Ezekiel, when they're describing the angels coming down, they're just describing combustion, metal, like physical, tangible tangible things you can touch that these aliens are coming down in and getting out of so why wouldn't ezekiel you know what i mean you see where i'm getting at with it yeah. where how i believe both of them to where i don't think they're mutually exclusive to where yeah there's there's multiple things at play here i believe i understand that you're saying that it's advanced but something that we would recognize as like oh that's like an airplane and and they would recognize as like oh it's like a chariot um you know, yeah. it's something else entirely. It's more than just an airplane, and, you know, it's even further beyond that. So I get what you're saying, that it, they're seeing something that's technologically beyond them, but I don't think that it is some sort of craft from another planet. I think it still could be something else that we're contextualizing in our minds because we think about traveling to other planets. We think about that since the, you know, the 60s and times when we were talking about going to the moon and things like that. 
Yeah. Well, hell, I mean, even in Greece, they were talking about interplanetary travel. Ancient Greece. So it's been around forever. So who knows how much that shaped storytelling culture and how much, you know. We're talking about here, like, what the sort of the engine of culture, like, what makes things move. And I definitely do think yeah. that uh, spirituality, folklore, and weird, odd experiences are something that moves people. You know, even the religions we talk about are based on, like, some kind of sighting or something, and it, it makes people move in a way. I think that's, that it's that's the number one mover. It's I think it's the absolute number one mover. Because what's the whole point of technology? The whole point of technology is to spread things to people faster. We're talking through space right now, man. So, yeah, it it is all about uh, conveying information, and we continue to rocket forward with better and quicker ways to do that. You know, we have international instantaneous communication right now. Because even if you just look at even just the movie. Yeah, uh, because movies would be a, a more advanced way of communicating ideas and, you know, playing out a meme or a, an idea. Exactly that. That's what I'm saying. It's propelling us forward even faster. Mm-hmm. And it's the number one propellant of human culture. It's just storytelling and the basis in reality and truth of that storytelling. Mm-hmm. I would agree. All, all the way back to the, you know, the cave walls when you're painting on the cave walls till, you know, modern day instantaneous communication. Um, I do wonder, though, when we'll ever get... Um, a universal language so we can all talk to each other without the barrier of translation i suppose um was it was google's working on babblefish yeah that that would be really cool okay so i think i've gone down uh most of my little symptom questions there of different things that uh could have happened you know based on the experience something i'd like to do with um you know witnesses because I, I feel that if someone has one experience they typically have others you know, I think that's shown from what you guys have said. Yeah, and it's nothing too, um, you know, too extreme with the sightings, the subsequent sightings either, I guess. Yeah. Which is what, when I read all these other witness sightings and stuff, it's like, why couldn't I get all the cool shit afterwards? I just got, like, nothing. Different <laughs> levels of involvement, you know. So, some people are meant to go to Venus and have <laughs> conversations with uh, spacemen from Lanulus or whatever. But some people are just yeah. meant to have the their lights flicker on and off every now and again. Yeah. Um, would either of you two want to be, if you had the option, to be like a contactee where you got some sort of contact from a alien or sentient being outside your understanding? Yes. <laughs> For sure. Okay, what about you, Ryan? I would just ask some questions even if I couldn't even possibly comprehend the answers. Exactly. Yeah. I certainly would as well, but I do feel like if they tried to explain... It's also just... terrifying, though. Well, depends on your, your mindset. Fire in the sky, that yeah. movie. <laughs> Think positive thoughts when the, when the light comes down. Just I don't know. It's, it's like something, again, just so just to see. Yeah, I feel like if they would give me answers, I wouldn't understand the answers. Because, you know, it's kind of like presenting to you like advanced algebra when you can't do addition. You know what I mean? Well, what was it they said? It's like trying to explain it to an ant. Yeah, exactly. That's, keel? Uh, that's the Mothman prophecies. Uh, you're more intelligent than a cockroach. Have you ever tried explaining yourself to one? What was the other theory? It's, you know, if you tag a bear, knock it out, you take it up in the helicopter, you put a weird collar on it, and then you drop it off somewhere that it wasn't out of this helicopter, this machine that it couldn't possibly understand. Yep. What's that bear going to go back and tell his bear friends? Mm-hmm. That, that's a, that is an alien abduction right there. Yep. In, in the, <laughs> The most literal terms, you you are alien, you are uh, foreign and unexplainable. So, yeah, that's an alien abduction. It's all about context. You you and I could have some some pretty, you know, long conversations because <laughs> we're both into theology and UFOs. Yeah, and it's all it's all the same to me. It's a whole it all ties in. Um also <laughs> crop circles. I, there's like a crop circle, a really old crop circle story where some guy says he'd rather the devil uh, mow his his field and then he sees like fire ship from the field and the devil makes a circle in the field and so it goes all the way back there with that and crop circles that's why the whole spirituality aspect of it when it ties in it's it's just what are you classifying as spirituality mm-hmm. like ufos are like the modern sort of form of spirituality as well as uh folkloric things yeah uh, it's still sort of fringe though when you really think about it yeah it's a it's a circle Yep. And that's all it is. It's, it's the same thing repackaged. And it all boils down to the same two questions. How do we get here? And how is the universe made? That's it. 
Okay, so I think we're going to bring this to a close now. Was there anything else that you two wanted to talk about or any other strange experiences and things you wanted to bring up? Not that I can think of. I mean, we need to get the... Need to do another group call, just kind of a more loose discussion. Yeah, well, I just now put up the the other one. It took a it took a bit to edit. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. Okay, Carly. I'm good. <laughs> I've got nothing uh, to add. So I want to thank you two for talking to me and answering my questions. Anytime, man. Thanks for having us. It's funny to try to pick away and say, okay, did this happen? Did this happen? Did you have anything like that? Because. There, there are a lot of people who they live their lives and they kind of view everything as normal. So even when something weird happens, you don't know until you really ask them, you know? Like, I've, I've gone up to people and asked them if they've seen anything weird, and they'll say no. And then I ask, did you ever see a light in the sky? And they'll say yes. So, you know, it's kind of difficult to sort of bring this out. So I'm glad that you guys were able to share your experiences. So thank you very much. Well, thank you. This is Mothman Historian, founder of the Appalachian Mystery Society. Signing off, Mountaineers are always free.